Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michelle Fannin Steele here for uh, Salt Cured Pig Office Hours. I'm your food safety admin. I'm the CEO over here at Durga Food Safety. And we are having a delightful, amazing day here in Maine because it's always a good day to be here in Maine. Um, we are doing process flow diagramming, and as I said, if this is the only one that you tune in for, tune in for this one. Even if you're just watching the video, we have the comments, of course. We always have the comments. Um, and we are going to do process flow diagramming for the bacon that we did um, the what do you make um, a couple weeks ago, I guess now. <laughs> so we're falling a little, falling a little behind, uh, um, but that's okay. We're going to give people uh, just a moment or so to join us, and then we're going to get going. Um, I think this is probably going to take a little longer than a half hour. Uh, so I scheduled it out for an hour, but it will definitely take less than an hour because I have somebody coming to the office at 1. So I'm aiming to end at about 12.50 um, Eastern time for those of you who are interested. So you can see people starting to join us. Uh, ping me if you can't hear me <laughs> um, so that I know that um, I'm going to do something about it. Uh, so I'm so happy everybody decided to join us. Uh, it's Monday, it's spring, it's time to start thinking about what you're doing for production. It is pleasantly quiet around here at the office. We have construction going on across the street. And, wow, it is quite something sometimes. And usually when I do a video, it is about the time when they start jackhammering. So let's <laughs> do our best here. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get going. Um, we have a lot to cover today. Uh, again, this is going to be archived. Uh, on the events page, you can go find it. You're always welcome to ask me questions. So this is HACCP step four. <laughs> I reorient myself. It's HACCP step four. So our first step was to uh, create our food safety team. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago and who and why it's so important to have folks on your food safety team. All right, and then we described um, who our intended user is, we described our food, all right, and now we are describing, um, now we are uh, writing our process flow diagram, okay, this is HACCP step four, it's followed by HACCP step five, which I actually can't do a live video on, really, um, because HACCP step five is to take this process flow diagram and walk through it in your facility and then sign off on it. And the person who signs off on it has to be a HACCP trained individual. These videos, delightful and amazing though they are, don't actually count. <laughs> okay, and so um, we are uh, we're going through this though so you can have an understanding so that you can get training so you know what the training um, involves. And of course, if you ever have any questions, I do do an online meat and poultry HACCP, which I'm happy to talk to you about. All right, so last time uh, we talked about what do you make, let's see if I can't get my video over here. So we did this, we diagrammed out what do you make, and we decided we were calling it salt cured pig bacon. God, we love bacon. I cured some this weekend. Um, and the ingredients were pork and salt and cure and spices and things like that. We had a good conversation about dried spices, ground spices, all that good sort of stuff. That is going to come into here. We are using cure number one. All right, that's incredibly important to know because we are going to make some, um, uh, we got to do some things uh, in order to incorporate using cure one. All right, those of you who are doing a, um, like an organic bacon process is not quite the same. All right. Um, packaging, suppliers, and then risks. All right, we've got some risks over here that we're gonna we're gonna start thinking about. So here's the here's the overview. All right, when we do process flow diagramming, all right, it is variations on a theme. All right, you receive stuff, you store stuff, you process stuff, you package and label stuff, you do finished product storage, and then you get rid of it. All right, every process is theme and variations on that. Okay, even, so I do process flow diagramming um, as part of business planning in my business, and um, even my process flow diagramming looks a lot like that, okay? Um, oops, I'm all caught up here. Hang on, that's why that feels so weird. Um, so we, you know, like we have a sales funnel, okay, we receive customers, we process customers doing work for them, all right? We give them stuff that's kind of like a package, and then we um, send them out on their merry way, all right? In whatever 
the work you're in, you probably have a process that you can diagram out. I highly recommend that you do that no matter what you're doing. One, because you know, um, process flow diagramming really gets you clear on what you're doing when with whom uh, in your business and will allow you to be more productive no matter what you do in life, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Algorithms for fun and profit. All right, so that being said, we're gonna, we're here to do process flow diagramming for bacon. All right, so the first thing that we are going to do, and I'm gonna hope my, my I, I'm using a thinner pen this time because we have a lot of information. It's gonna be like 15 steps, all right? So hang on to your hats. So the first thing that we do, okay, is that we receive stuff, all right? All of our stuff, is written out over here, okay? We gotta receive meat ingredients, we gotta receive non-meat ingredients, we're gonna receive restricted ingredients because we're using restricted ingredients, all right? And then we're gonna receive packaging and labeling, all right? That's why we do this part first, and you have to do this with enough detail. If you have questions about that, go watch that video. All right, so we're gonna receive stuff. This is gonna take me a second to watch, I'm sorry my back is gonna to be to you, but you can use the time to ask questions. All right, so we're gonna receive meat, E-I-V-E. -E. All right, anybody who knows me in real life knows that I can't spell, so you didn't have to love me anyway. Um, we're gonna receive dry ingredients. We're gonna receive restricted ingredients, okay? Um, I do this separately because um, it does end up being a critical control point and I, it's easier for me to keep track of that way. All right, and then we're gonna receive packaging and labeling them. Um, all right, I will do a close up of this um, and I will take a picture of it when we're done so that people can reference it. All right, so we've received stuff. All right, then we're gonna store stuff. All right, store, 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 store. Okay, so we have received meat and we've stored meat. So we're receiving pork from Dunthorpe Farms. Thanks, Greg, I'm sure it's amazing beef. Or amazing pork, all right? And we are probably getting pork bellies or we're getting whole carcasses. Whatever we're doing, we have to trim that up to actually get bellies, all right? Unless you're receiving bellies. If you're receiving bellies, we should have labeled pork bellies over here, all right? But I'm, I'm saying from Greg, because we do whole carcass utilization, we're gonna receive pork carcasses, all right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we're gonna do with our pork carcass, all right, is we're gonna bring it out of the refrigerator and we're gonna cut it down so that we have a belly to cure, all right? So that's the first thing we're gonna do, all right? So uh, I'm gonna write that as fabricate carcass, all right? Now, because we do whole carcass utilization, that carcass is gonna go um, to another HACCP plan, like um, making fresh sausage, so a raw brown HACCP plan, it's gonna go to whatever, and so we're gonna draw an arrow, done. We're gonna draw an arrow from here, all right? And this is gonna to go to other HACCP plants, all right? To raw ground, all right? Because when you fabricate a carcass, even if you're mostly making whole cuts, you are going to fabricate trim, that's where trim comes from, all right? And we put, Trim in our sausage tray. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's see here. Um, so we're gonna fabricate our carcass, all right, and we're gonna get our belly, and then we're gonna weigh the meat. Mm -hmm. All right, this weigh step becomes very, very important the way I do food safety planning. Okay, let me see if I can get that even closer. Mm -hmm. I wish there was a way to zoom on my camera, but. I'm potentially not that smart. Ugh. That's a little better. Okay, sorry, it's a lot of steps. But I promise I will give you a nice zoomed in picture. Okay, so we're gonna fabricate the carcass and we're gonna weigh the meat. All right, so then our meat is prepped. All right, Think you can, for those of you who are restaurant and chef type folks and who have come up through the restaurant world, think of this as your mise en place, 
all right? You can actually take that whole concept. I tried to do this earlier in my business, like several years ago, and I didn't really get anywhere with it, but, but all of this prep work, all right, is creating a mise en place so that you can create the product that you want to create. All right, so we're going to receive dry ingredients, store dry ingredients, all right, and then from those dry ingredients, we're going to um, usually, you know, if we're looking at our pepper and our salts and all that good sort of stuff, we're going to weigh our dry ingredients. All right, now we're going to receive our restricted ingredients, okay? We're going to store our restricted ingredients. We generally store those separately, which is why I have it as a separate um, as a separate step, all right, and we are going to weigh E-I-G-H restricted ingredients. All right, weighing your meat, weighing your dry ingredients, and weighing your restricted ingredients is a manufacturing process. And don't tell me you don't do things by weights in kitchens, because I know that you do, <laughs> all right? It's not different here. You gotta do things by weights here, all right? So we're gonna weigh all of that stuff together, okay? And then, most of the time, all right, we're gonna combine it in some fashion. I'm gonna get my um, cheat sheets here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna combine it in some fashion, all right, and we're going to, um, I don't know what we'll do. We'll do a combine here because you're going to take your salt and your pepper and everything and you're going to mix it together with your restricted ingredients. At least I hope so because that's what I did this weekend in my house. All right, and then we're going to dry rub the meat. Now, chances are this meat is going to have to be dry rubbed and it's going to have to sit because this cure has to penetrate. All right, and so then we're going to go to whip storage, it's called, the work in progress storage. Now, I want to tell you, it is surpassingly important that whip storage is labeled. You got to have lot numbers. Everything that we're doing here has to be traceable. You got to go know what lots of pepper, of salt, of cure, all that sort of stuff. All right, and this whip storage, you need to have you need to have lot numbers associated with this whip storage. Okay, so we're going to dry rub things, and then it's going to go into work in progress whip storage. All right, and then a lot of times we are going to um, there. I probably I don't say a lot of times, but sometimes we're going to have I'm going to draw some dashed lines here. Okay, we're going to have an alternate to rinse meat. There are people who rinse, all right? Um, so we're gonna either go to whip storage and rinsing, or we're gonna go from dry rubbing or rinse storage to the heat step, all right? That's heating. Now, this is bacon. I can't even tell you how many conversations we have had on the page <laughs> around doing um, uh, cold smoking, and if there is a definition of cold smoking, um, and there isn't. There is no legal definition of cold smoking, okay? There is a raw product critical limit table, which we'll talk about when we get to critical limits. There is um, Appendix A, which is how we heat stuff, all right? And there is um, refrigerated temperatures. That's about it, <laughs> okay? Um, and so you gotta conform within there. Uh, joules, weights to how many decimals? Um, I don't really go too terribly crazy. Um, I think that, you know, if you're doing things, okay, so the first thing is we do things in metric. Make your life easy, do things in metric. All right, now for those of you who are getting pre-bended spices where it's like, you know, however many ounces to 100 pounds of meat, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Don't buy pre-blended spices is what I would say. Um, and so for, for if, you're doing, if you're doing metric and you've got 100 kilos of meat, um, I would say that doing two significant digits, no more than three significant digits, because honestly, it's not, um, if you do your cure correctly, you have a range of your parts per million that you have to, that you have to meet. And the more significant digits you have, the more accurate your calibration checking must be, and the worse your paperwork situation is. <laughs> okay, so do the best you can. All right. Um, all right, so we're going to heat 
all right? That which we heat up, we must also cool down, all right? So I don't ever want to see, I'm putting my teacher hat on here, not that I didn't have it on, but I don't ever want to see anybody turning in a HACCP plan where you heat something and you don't cool it. You must cool stuff, all right? Cool, oh, we're gonna heat it, we're gonna cool it, all right? And then, let me just make sure I'm on track here. Um, da, 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 da. Yes, I am still on track. Okay, so we've got these bellies, we've heated them, um, we've cooled them, we've rolled them into the smoker, okay, we've smoked them, the smoke's either done a shower on them or we've moved them out into a chilled space so that they'll cool, we cool according to Appendix D, I promise I will go over that again, all right, I'm going to pull them out and they're cooling, all right, once they are cooled, we got to get them ready for packaging. Okay, so depending on how you sell them, all right, and we determined what we were selling back there, and I think we're selling, uh, I think we were not doing, look at all my, da 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 I think we did not determine that we are, um, we are, we're, we're, we're selling whole bellies, so we're gonna sell sliced bellies, all right? Um, so we are going to, um, most bacon, um, if you get it down to uh, below 40 and like above 35, it's still really, really hard to slice. Okay, and so most bacon, we have a um, a optional uh, freeze step. Okay, to just harden that fat up so it doesn't smear all over everything in your um, uh, in your slicer. All right, and so we're going to trim and slice it. All right, so from cooling, we can go to trim and slicing, depending on your how you do things, it's fine. All right, and then from trimming and slicing, it goes into package and label. Label. And then from packaging and label, we go to distribution. And now we go to finished product storage. Ha, oh, my bad. Finished product. Storage. Now, this almost inevitably will bring up the question on storage. So we have storage here, we have storage here, and we have storage here. All right. Next time we get together next week, okay, we're going to be talking about a hazard analysis and whether or not hazards are reasonably likely to occur. However, I want to tell you raw product storage work in process storage and finished product storage are all three separate steps, three separate steps in your HACCP, okay? Because the material is in really different forms at that point, okay? And I think you will write a better HACCP if you um, separate out the different kinds of storage, okay? So um, we packed it and labeled it, we did finished product storage, and then we did distribution, all right? So we're gonna draw a arrow here to packaging and labeling. We are gonna add in rework slash reprocessing and refuse, okay? So when we fabricate, we're gonna get it. When we trim and slice, we're gonna get it, okay? Um, we can rework uh, and reprocess, probably have rework and reprocess, and rework and reprocess will probably go back and forth through whip storage. Rework is product that comes back to you from, um, uh, from the outside. Reprocessing is stuff that you leave over from the next day that never left your never left your uh, facility. All right, if we use trim in the trim slicing step, I would assume we flow to another HACCP. Yeah, so there are a lot of people then that will take that, Jules. That's a great point, especially if you want to sell me hamburger, uh, or hamburg as we say here in Maine. Uh, if we do this and we go to raw ground, okay, you can incorporate your trimmed up belly bits into your raw ground HACCP plan and you can make bacon burgers under USDA inspection. 
Um, a lot of people do that for, um, uh, what are they called, uh, uh, dry-aged ribeyes. When you trim up your dry-aged ribeye, the, the hassle planning for that is not nearly as complicated because they're a quick step. Um, but you can trim stuff out and take it from a raw, um, uh, not ground, um, a raw intact tacit plan to a raw non intact tacit plan. All right. So that, my friends, is the basics of process flow diagramming. All right. If you're going to do this on your own, I highly recommend doing this with post it notes. Okay. Because you're going to move things around. All right. And I also don't recommend spending much more than 45 minutes doing this. Get your team together, okay? Get your post-it notes with receive and store and all the different things that you receive and store, okay? And then go to a wall, put your post-it notes up there, all right? Do your first round, make sure you've answered all the questions you think that you need to answer, and then go back to your regular day. Because what will happen is, is that your brain will be thinking about what is it that we do, what is our process? Okay, the more accurate you can get this, all right, the more accurate. I mean, you saw we came back and we, we worked on this because the truth is, folks, the process of writing is rewriting, and it doesn't matter if you're writing a paper on Faulkner or you're writing a HACCP plan or you're doing a budget. We write, we think, and we rewrite. You know, when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching this class, um, I, I tell a story. There's a... Uh, uh, a new translation, well, it's not all that new anymore, it's like five years old, a new translation of War and Peace out there. And um, the, inch, the one of the foremost scholars of War and Peace um, was Vladimir Nabokov. And Vladimir Nabokov, most people know him from writing Lolita, but he was a Russian literature scholar, taught, taught at my college, actually. Wrote Lolita at my college. Um, and he um, had great sympathy for Tolstoy, because what Tolstoy was trying to do was um, take the instant in time of the court in Russia and the beauty and the intrigue and the dresses and the politics and put it down on paper. And Tolstoy told everyone he was a liar, okay, because he couldn't get it completely accurately. And Nabokov spent a lot of time saying he did the best he could. Tolstoy did the best he could, okay? And so by committing this stuff to paper, you're going to not be accurate, all right? Do not hold yourself to a higher standard than Tolstoy, all right? It's probably good writing that we do here at Dirigo Food Safety. It's not Tolstoy, <laughs> okay? So be kind to yourself. Do the best you can, and don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Something down on paper is better than nothing down on paper, all right? Through this process, you're going to realize you have to rewrite um, some of the stuff that you're actually doing. You're going to have to say, okay, is there a market out there for whole bellies? Is there somebody who wants me to sell them whole smoked bellies? Maybe they want to do something else with it in their restaurant or, um, or in their process, and they want to cut it up and, and use it and not have sliced bacon. Who knows? But it's only through asking these questions that we are um, we are able to even contemplate those different avenues of business, all right? So the more accurate you can get this, all right, the better hassle planning you will do. But there are some caveats to that, okay? So the caveats are, you will notice that I didn't put anything about sanitation in here, okay? It's not clean the walking cooler and then receive meat, all right? If you remember, we do all of our good manufacturing practices to create the conditions to create safe food, okay? We presume in process flow diagramming that your good manufacturing practices are working. Okay, um, I usually do this by, <laughs> by an illustration. I was, a, um, I was an Irish step dancer after college. Remember when river dance was so popular? Well, I got into Irish step dancing and I was actually fairly good at it. And, um, but the trick in any dancing, um, you know, we're getting on recital, any dancing, 
you put your foot down and you know that it is there. If I'm going up on my toes, I have to trust that my foot is there, right? And I have to align my body so that my foot is there. It's not different. If you are receiving meat, you have to trust that your cooler is in a condition to receive meat. It's cold, it's clean, it has functioning thermometers. All of those are good manufacturing practices, okay? And you, they're called practice. You do them over and over, and you do the right thing the right way every time you do it, and then you will know that your good manufacturing practices are there. We don't write down personnel wash hands. That is understood. Your personnel are not coming in here and fabricating carcasses with dirty hands. If they are, you have problems that process flow diagramming is not going to solve. All right, so the other thing that this process flow diagramming does for you is it uncovers where you have questions. Where in your organization do you have leadership issues? Do you have training issues? Do you have safety issues? You know, um, <clears throat> I, I do a lot of this and they're like, well, if I have to store chemicals separately, what does it mean about the chemical storage I'm already doing? because I'm storing my WD-40 with my dry ingredients. I, real live conversation, my friends. Okay, so it brings up those sorts of conversations. Mm -hmm. All right, but this is process flow diagramming. The slower and more deliberate and better you do process flow mapping, process flow diagramming, better your hazard analysis will be, okay, and the better HACCP plan you will get out of it, all right? When I do this, all right, we spend so much more time on the first half of the 12 steps of HACCP than we do on the second half of the 12 steps of HACCP because you do this stuff right, the, the hazard analysis doesn't drop out of it. That's still pretty complicated. We'll go over that um, next time. Um, but critical control points, critical limits, it all becomes super, super, super easy. All right, and so that's what I have for you. And I am actually at the half hour mark. So I will give everybody a minute to ask questions. Um, and then I'm going to, let's see if I do this correctly. Um, and I'm going to zoom in. I'm gonna do the old fashioned zoom in of, there you go. So, and I will take a picture of this and I will, um, I will put it, uh, up and then the next time we get together uh, next week, we are going to do hazard analysis. We're going to take every single solitary one of these steps and we are going to write a hazard analysis for it. We're not all going to do it together. I'm just going to I'm just going to do a couple of the steps so you can see what it looks like. All right, but there you go. That is process flow diagramming. All right, I'm going to put this back and answer Joseph's question. Would you ever represent a step in a prereq as part of the process flow diagramming? No, you wouldn't. Because in USDA, um, if you write it down in your HACCP plan and you don't do it, you have potentially made adulterated food. Okay, if you don't do your prerequisite programs, in reality, yes, you may have made adulterated food, but by legal definition, you haven't. <laughs> okay, so we don't put steps in prerequisite programming. So calibration checks are not in here, um, temperature checks, all that sort of stuff does not go into this. Now, that being said, all right, there are ways that we write to communicate to the USDA. There are ways that we write to communicate to our team, all right, and I highly recommend what we call make sheets, which I will probably do as, as like chapter 13 of, press, of, of HACCP planning, where every product gets a make sheet, all right? And that, that first, you know, like the, the make sheets are written out, all right, where it's we get cold meat out of the refrigerator and we take a temperature of it, initials, date, and time. We weigh our restricted ingredients, initials, date, and time. So your prerequisite programs are generally reflected in your logging and not your process flow diagramming. Okay, hope that answered your question, Joseph. Um, 
do you uh, recommend a mind mapping tool for use um, in outlining? Um, I do mind mapping um, the way I was taught in high school. <laughs> I do it on a, uh, I do it old school on a whiteboard, <laughs> even though I was taught on a chalkboard in high school. Um, and so for drawing this sort of stuff out, um, we do ours in um, the Google Presenter or Google Slides or whatever it's called. Um, you can also do it in PowerPoint. And I tell you what, um, the reason I say do it on um, do it on Post-it notes first. Uh, is because <laughs> once you get all the steps, really, the biggest issue is formatting. And the number of times, like, the swearing that goes along here in trying to get arrows to go where they are supposed to be and to fit everything on one page, <sighs> it's delightful. <laughs> so we do the best we can. But I have found presentation, PowerPoint, that sort of thing to be the most helpful for actually getting the format down to what you want. So we write our process flow diagrams actually separate from the rest of the document that creates the HACCP plan because um, it just makes the formatting easier. I cannot, for love or money, format in Word, um, and I cannot really format it in Excel. Um, and so those are, those are my recommendations for software um, when we do this kind of stuff. So, all right, any other questions, my friends? Anything that you have come up with on the page this week, you are more than welcome to type in there in the comments. I'll give everybody a moment or two, and then we will get back on our day, and I'll get ready for my client coming to the uh, coming to the office. So, so doing something completely different from bacon. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's nothing else, you guys have been a delightful audience. Thank you so much for your participation. As always, this is going to be. Um, archived on the page. I will, um, to, I'm going to tidy this up a little bit, I guess, um, and I will, um, I will post a picture, and then the next time we get together, we're going to do hazard analysis, um, and I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to go about doing that, because we have, I mean, that's probably a 18, 19, 20 step process. Um, but we'll figure it out. If you have anything that you desperately like to see a hazard analysis done on, hint, hint, somebody needs to ask me about cooking, cooling, and weighing restricted ingredients. Um, and, uh, but we'll cover that next time. So thanks, you guys have been great. I love you all. Um, salutations from scenic uh, Yarmouth, Maine, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks, have a great day.